Hi, my name is Daniel Neal. I'm the curator of Troy University Rosa Parks Museum. Uh, I'm joined today by our good friend Tim Kerr, artist. From uh, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Hi, y'all. Um, we've started... Uh, We're the ZZ Top Appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> Tim has uh, brought us a uh, really fantastic exhibition of his uh, visual artwork. Um, it's launched our um, sort of year of learning and community uh, here at the Rosa Parks Museum in honor of the 60th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott. So thanks, Tim. No, thank you. Uh, this is this is a bigger deal to me than being in the Museum of Modern Art. This is really, really amazing. So tell us how uh, you became interested in in this portrait work. I think we can see some of it here. Uh, Portraits of people who engaged in resistance, people who engaged in uh, struggles for freedom. What what was the first sort of thing that got you thinking you wanted to, to create uh, that kind of art? Because I've been doing art since elementary school, playing music and art since elementary school, and it always amazes me when people separate that stuff and they just, you know, oh, you're the musician that does art. Because it's like, no, it's all coming from the same place. What, and, uh, I always did that stuff uh, when the band things all started up, 78, 79, everything kind of shifted and it was more music oriented than it was art, though we were still doing lots of art uh, with the posters and you know the album covers and things like that. And, uh, and about, you know, that was a, you're talking 78, 79, so about 10 years ago, there were some people that started asking me to uh, they knew that I'd done art, or I'd done big paintings before, like back 75, 76, right. 77, and asked if I wanted to show in a gallery. And I, coming from what I'd come from, and coming through all these bands and everything, I have the realization that, you know, I've been telling people this last night and a bunch, but somebody can see your glasses, go and buy them in the afternoon because they like them, you just influence somebody. Right. And you didn't even, even realize. So if I'm going to start putting stuff up on walls for people to see, I want to be some sort of a positive influence, even though that's corny, it's just a fact. And I started at first painting people that influenced me, that were just, you know, like things that I'd heard, like John Coltrane was first. Um, kind of went that route. I actually painted Rose Parks pretty pretty early on, mm -hmm. probably like, you know, there's a story that you know, my wife Beth tells of, you know, I was trying to find, I paint on everything but canvas because why be another painting on canvas? Here's another good painting on canvas. I'd rather do something different. And uh, so I was trying to get the bus map from here right. because I wanted to paint Rosa on the bus map and I wanted to mark where she had gone on and off. and. Uh, I think pretty sure we called this place up looking right. for the, the bus map, you know, kind of thing. So, but it, that's kind of where it all comes from. It's that it, it's it's trying to show people that every every person that I'm presenting or painting did what they did because it came from here. They didn't do it to be famous. They did it, which means we're all capable, even though we won't realize we did it or not. It's like you you can cause, one person can cause the change, so. Right on. Does that answer it? It does. Uh, does that answer it? You <laughs> made me think of uh, something uh, when you said that. Um, and I think about coming through like the early days of independent music. I know uh, your band in Texas, The Big Boys, was a big influence. You were just telling us about some uh, modern incarnations of grunge and yeah, uh, yeah. Poison 13. Poison 13, yeah. right. But what, where is that line? Where is the, the, a lot of your work is painted on cardboard or maps or found materials. It's got an immediacy and a passion to it and yet it's, it's moved, in this instance, it's moved off the streets and into a gallery. Yeah. And, and the same thing with, with uh, do-it-yourself music of independent music. It moves from somebody's bedroom to a garage to yeah. a, a club to uh, the Grammys, right? W do you think about that continuum and that line when you're working on your work or how that? No, because I think you'd have to be pretty vain to think that you're going to 
you know, you're going to be the next. I don't know. I just, I, I'm not like that at all. I just do what I do, you know, hopefully my best foot forward, you know, 20 years from now, I can still stand behind it and say, yeah, I did that instead of saying, yeah, I did that, but you know, <laughs> right. kind of thing. And it's right. just, it, it's, it's, you know, as long as you're standing up for yourself, it doesn't really matter where you're presenting it if you're being yourself and right. doing what you stand behind. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, no, I mean, just thinking about influence and things that do influence people. I know uh, working in, a, in museum spaces and gallery spaces, um, sometimes people come to the situation with a preloaded idea of what well, I know what art is, or yeah. I might not know what art is, but I know I know it when I see it, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and I, I, one of the things I really appreciate about your work, um, you know, you, you do paint on cardboard, you do paint on skateboards, you, you're pushing that envelope wider to what people might think they know art is, you know? Yeah, but the people that, that say they think they know is right. the cool lunchroom table. And that's, and that's <laughs> such a small part of the cafeteria that it's just like, who can why, you know, I mean, it, it's sad to me that so many people feel like they need to be validated by that cool lunchroom table instead of, you just created this, you did this piece of music, you had a band, you put a record out. You're validated. You just did right. something. You right. don't need to be on the Matrix. You don't need to be in the Museum of Modern Art and stuff like, you know, great if it happens, but you don't need to change anything to do that. You don't, you know, you're, you're validated. So it's, it's... I don't know, I just think it's, I, I do what I do, you know, I just, I don't, uh, I don't think that there, I haven't really ever put boundaries on stuff because I, I think with especially self-expression, there shouldn't be any boundaries. I mean, it's just, if you already kind of put the barriers up, you're limiting what you might, the possibilities, right, right. you know, what, what they are and stuff. So it, it's, it's, teach his own, but that's me. That's right. just, you know. Would you say you're your own toughest critic? When I say I'm what? Would you say you're your own toughest critic? Do you, do you challenge yourself uh, in what you're? I mean, you know, I, I do things until I like them, you right. know, and then once I like it, then I'm fine with it, you know, kind of deal. Right. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, I mean, all, you know, all of self-expression is so subjective that it's it's really neither here nor there if somebody I mean it's nice when other people like it and it's great but right. it's kind of you know it, it's funny because with the music you know when a lot of times when you would get a really good review right. which I didn't I stopped reading reviews probably in mid 90s or early 90s or something because it would be a really great review but it would still piss you off because it was like they they, they had such a limited vocabulary on music and what you know what things were coming from that it was just like you know they didn't realize no there's like there's Aaron Copeland in this there's John Coltrane in right. this there's like it's not just MC5 blah, 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 you know kind of right yeah so I okay, mean yeah. and it's and it's weird too because you don't want to be like this you don't want to say I'm not I'm not I'm not that sort of a person but each his own, you know, it's not. Well, see, I think that's a really great point. I, I think it comes through in your work very clearly when, you know, when you encounter it, you're kind of hit with this, um, this line quality, the color composition, and then you begin to see how much research goes into this. And, and it, it, there are several hundred different personages and different movements. Uh, some of the same movement that are represented in this show. How do you, um, how's your research process? Do you read uh, something yeah, that I'm leads like, you down I'm, that road? I'm, and People will kind of tell me about something and I'll, you know, look it up, find out more, realize, oh man, that's connected to this, you know, kind of like I start. It's, I was telling somebody yesterday, the, the uh, it's amazing to me, I'll go back to music, but the, it's, if you had the seed in you to begin with to start looking for something that wasn't presented to you really easy, like on the radio or things like that, would you stop for? Like what, what happens that, you know, we've all got friends like that. You know, music stopped in 1983, who's could do, right. that kind of thing. I had, the, the funniest one was I was, at a, I was 
in the 90s. I was working at the libraries, I was recording all those bands in bands, and I was working at a stained glass place. Like there was right. all kinds of stuff going on. And, uh, and there was one summer where uh, Kathleen, the woman that ran the studio, had these kind of kids come in to kind of help with it. And there was a kid, and this was right when John Spencer was starting to get big, you know, the uh, nation, uh, um, God, what were they called? Nation Ulysses, those right. bands were kind of. So if you saw a kid dressed like gangs in West Side Story, you know, with the suits and everything, right. then you pretty much knew they were probably into like Jonathan Fire Eater or the bands that were happening at that point that were starting to kind of put that style out, right. kind of thing. And I, one day it's me and this kid, and we start talking. And it got pretty heated because the kid's like telling me, he's making statements. He's, he's probably 20 years old. You know, I'm 59 now, so I was probably, I don't know what, like, you know, late 40s or whatever. And, and the kid's telling me that there's never going to be any music any better than The Beatles, The Doors, and Led Zeppelin. And I'm trying to tell him about the makeup and Jonathan Fire Eater and like all these Discord bands and Fugazi and things. And, and it, I'm, I'm saying it got heated. And then I started laughing. And the kid's kind of like looking at me like, and I said, you know, somebody really ought to be filming this. Right. And the kid's kind of looking at me. I said, because you're, you're telling me what my generation says to your generation. And I'm trying to tell you <laughs> right. about, you know, so it was, right. it's, yeah. What about... Um the relationship between, I know you said that it all comes from the same place, but um, can you talk about the relationship between social movements and resistance and music? Like how do those, how do those two ideas kind of coexist? And Well, because the, the, you know, you have, I mean, you obviously have art, music, any of this stuff, you have the ones that are basically doing it to be famous and get rich and and you know the the funniest thing about all of that is if if we all knew the secret to how this stuff worked we'd all be rich you know there right. there is no you know but you also have the people that realize that you might can plant a seed you might can say something that might mean something to somebody else or connects with it and that starts them into right. what they're doing and right. i've always gravitated towards that i've just always well and i mean i I'm looking at it across the way here. You can't see it. Um, Turn the camera. Is uh, <laughs> Woody Guthrie up here with that famous guitar that says "This machine kills fascists," right? Yeah. And um, the image of Woody Guthrie with that guitar is then connected, in my mind, to those songs of uh, economic disenfranchisement, the Dust Bowl, all the 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 things that Woody was. Um, singing about yeah and uh, so yeah I think I think but that's there's a been a history of that that's been going on you know Minutemen have that great song about punk rock is folk music or something right I think there's some right. kind of statement that Mike made or you know D Boone or somebody like it's pretty great so well I think that's true too I, I mean I grew up um, you know, I listened to your your band and when I was a kid in Birmingham, riding the skateboard. Which one? Yeah, <laughs> big boys. Um, but um, I'll put you on the spot. What, what was your fate? No, no, no. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, we we did associate um, sort of that uh, spirit coming through you guys as music, um, and a lot of other bands that were around yeah, at the same time. You know, that that. Um, if you rejected sort of the the normative middle class values of America and said I, I'm not really as happy with that idea as I am being an artist or or being a thinker or being a creative person, I want to go this other way. That that music was music for the people who wanted that self expression, wanted yeah. that creativity. Well, that was the whole point too of adding to it. Go start your own band. It was like okay, right. if you if you're if you're already starting to like, hmm, what kind of thing? It's like, yeah, come on, start your own. That's why everything in here is signed your name here. Because it's like, if you look at the bottom of this thing and to see who did this piece of art and you see your name here, it's like, yep, come on, you can do something. You can right. you do art, you can do music, you can design clothes, you can dance, you can write, you can take photo. I mean, it's just, right. it's endless. So, right. And it's sad when people don't tap into that at some point and do 
their own self-expression, you know? I mean, once again, to each his own, but you're kind of missing out, you know? Because right. there's you know, a lot more going on. Well, and I think, I would say, um, at this point, you mentioned your um, push in middle age there, and... Um, 59. That, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a very American uh, spirit to what your life's work has been. It's um, that you will express your voice, and that voice uh, is, can be an opposition. It can be a voice for freedom. Uh, it can be a voice that limits oppression in other people. That's what I think a lot of the, the images of people you've painted are. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's actually what drew me to your work, to have it here at the Rosa Parks Museum. Yeah. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do in this uh, changing exhibition space is there's a lot of facts about the civil rights movement and uh, there's official histories. Um, I had a guy come in the other day, the uh, pastor that stopped by and said um, he was tired of these four and no more, yeah. the, the core group of yeah. civil rights icons. So I think and when- And he came back. And he came back came to the back opening the other night. Which was cool. Um, but when you see uh, what you've done here where you've connected the free dairy movement with Sojourner Truth, that you've yeah. drawn a line across humanity and you've drawn a line for freedom, for freedom of expression. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, a, that's an amazing quality to, to what you've done. Well, here. I mean, you know, you could do it, you could do it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't know what to say. I, right. You know, thank you, but <laughs> it's, um, it's like I'm saying, if you, it, I don't know, I just, it's just, I figure everybody sees like that. I get. I don't know. I don't know what to even. I, I don't know, you know how to answer that. So. I think if everybody saw uh, exactly like this that, this is when everybody's starting to turn the channels and stuff. Because <laughs> they're like, okay, what is this? What are these guys talking about? <laughs> um, if uh, if everybody saw it though, um, there wouldn't be these voices of opposition, right? Um, we'd have this sort of world of free expression. World. Well, you'd hope, but I yeah. mean, yeah. So that's why. I mean, that the. the this is kind of what we're talking about and kind of not, I may be going off on something else, but, but uh, early on, I had somebody ask me, why don't I paint my history? Like, of, you know, I've been through a lot of stuff and how come I don't paint Ian or why don't I paint, you know, just the stuff I've been through and the right. people. And it kind of took me aback for a minute, but then I started realizing what was going on was that at least at that point in time, most everybody that was seeing what I was doing, they knew about all of that. I wanna show right. them right. stuff that led up to that or might have influenced these people, you know, to right. do what they're doing now instead of just, you know, the same old same, so. As we begin to, just what you said, examine our own life in connection, you might not find a one-to-one -one relationship with civil rights icons, but in the freedom movement there is a, there's a path um, around the, yeah. the edges. I, I, that's an enjoyable. Well, there's a thread. There's a thread that's running through it all. Right. So, you know, I mean, you know, you're talking about Woody Guthrie, but there's also Pete Seeger who was doing just as much and, right. you know, had on his banjo, you know, this machine you know, encompasses love or something. Right. I can't that's even remember right. what all it had on there. It's, now, that was an interesting uh, thing we were talking about, too, on our driving tours, just how much music played into um, the, the movement, and Harry Belafonte and the big concert out at the City of St. Jude. So I mean, I hear those same connections with your work and in, in independent music and your work in this art. Um, oh, cool. It's, um, I mean, the, the, the best compliment I think I ever got ever, and this was back when I was going to art school, which um, was there was a woman, like you would have, uh, Critiques, critiques, you know, critiques yeah. and stuff. And this woman who didn't know I played music, had no idea at all, and she literally says, when she's looking at my stuff, she goes, you know, when I look at your stuff, I hear music. Hmm. And I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty that's amazing good. compliment. Right. That's cool, you know, kind of thing, so. Yeah, I just think it's, it's like I'm saying, the thread runs through it all, and it's, it's I do. I mean, I'm hearing music all the time. I'm seeing stuff all the time. Right. You know, it's, I always thought everybody saw things like photos and stuff, you know, constantly, you know, so it's, 
And I kind of think everybody can. They just need to tune into it to do it. So, right. yeah. Yeah. What about um, skateboarding? I mean, is that lifestyle of skateboarding and how and you mentioned you were a surfer first. Yeah, I grew up surfing. And, uh, you know, I skated back when Beach Boys were singing what they were singing, and they came out with, like, clay wheels, and people were taking their roller skates apart. And right. On a, you know, but, I mean, those the wheels were so, you know, was, if you hit any sort of even little pebble, you were just, <laughs> like, pitched over. And, and uh, But I went to, uh, when I graduated from high school, I went with a friend to California and uh, surfing and urethane wheels had just come out and I was on Huntington Beach Pier and there's a, a bank or there used to be a bank underneath the pier and I saw these two guys like surfing that bank right and I just thought oh, that's that's pretty cool and when I got up to you know right after that summer I went up to Austin and I couldn't go surfing you know every day and stuff so I just got a board I actually bought a board when I was in California and got a board and uh, started skating up there and you know, that's, I mean, if it, if it really wasn't for skating, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now with you. I mean, uh, big boys would have never happened. I, I don't know what would have happened, mm. you know, because everybody that was involved with that first band all skated. Right. And we all, you know, just biscuit, you know, we could be skating with him out at Pflugerville, and his hair got shorter and shorter and shorter. And here came this new music that was coming. And for me, it was just, it was interesting, but I was so much into acoustic music that, that I didn't necessarily not like it. It was just, I just wasn't kind of something I, and we all went to Raul's just to go see what this stuff was about. Right. And the thing that I saw right off was that there wasn't a stage anymore. There, I mean, there was a stage, but it's, hard, it's psychologically there wasn't the barrier anymore. There right. wasn't the crowd was just as important as the band that was up there playing. Right. Uh, people are yelling at the back of the you know show like "Sound asleep, we're sound asleep," you know, and they were just <laughs> right. as, getting as much response as the band was. Everybody in that crowd was either in bands, they were taking photos, they were doing fanzines, they were just doing hook, line, and sinker. I thought this right. is good. Music didn't even have anything to do with it. It was just, this is, this is pretty freaking amazing that all these people are doing stuff. How can I be a part of this? What can I do? Kind of thing. And so Chris and I were skating, and Chris played guitar and played, uh, you know, ACDC, Ted Nugent, basically what Junkyard ended up playing, which is a band he was in right. later. Um, and I played Burt Yanch, you know, John Renborn, John Martin, that kind of type of stuff. We flipped a coin to see who was gonna play bass. <laughs> right. Because we were gonna just, what can we, let's see if we can play a Raul's one time. Right. And that's, right. that's how it got going, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, we were skaters that just started this band up. It wasn't like we, we're going to do skate rock or something like that. It was right. just we all skated and we played this music right. kind of thing. And when we went to San Francisco, Beth actually wrote to Thrasher, and Thrasher was a fanzine at the time. It wasn't even right. a magazine right. yet. It was like this big folded up paper. And, you know, basically we were writing to him not to be in the, because, you know, there wasn't, it's hard for people to comprehend now that back then, there was, you're not going to be on the radio. You're not making money doing this right. stuff. There's no magazines that are going to be writing about you or any kind of stuff like that. And we wrote to Thrasher just to go skating. He said, hey, we're coming to San Francisco. Let's go skate. Where do you want to skate at? Come meet us. Kind right. of thing. Mofo, Kevin met us. We went skating. Mofo decided he wanted to write an article about us. And it turned into Wild Riders of Boards, which was kind of more of a cartoon. Yeah, and I remember that. And he pretty much coined the phrase skate rock, and here yeah. we go. And so we were basically the first skate rock band. So even right. though we weren't, you know, to me, JFA kind of is because that's how they promoted themselves. That's and right. they're great. They're a great, great band. And uh, Brian's wonderful. But, you know, we just we just all skated and played music, you know, kind of. You know, it's. It's interesting. I mean, I personally believe that there is something to um, people who like skateboarding. It's um, there's a freedom to it. There's an independence. It's, it's a challenge. You sort of against the environment, or you against your own. Well, it's just level. you against yourself. Right. You know, I mean, you're not really even against yourself. It's you having fun, and you don't have to worry 
about the other person that much other than you have to worry where they are so you don't like run into them and right. break something but right. I mean and it's the same thing with surfing you know it's like a lot of those those sports that are just kind of a one you know I'm sure like running long distances right. is the same sort of thing it's just this you know kind of I don't know so well, there's I, a consciousness though too like I I just read this article that I thought was so amazing that in uh, Afghanistan under a repressive... Oh yeah, the um, women, they're the, the women girls. can't ride bicycles. Yeah, the girls are skating. Yeah, and so they're cool. starting to skate, yeah, yeah. and I'm thinking, hmm, skating. Yeah. And then I read another one, there was somewhere else that uh, had some issues, and uh, a group of skaters from another country came in and built some like street yeah, tricks yeah. and things, and uh, people just went nuts for it. You know? Well, the thing too, you know, Beth There's and I... There's a freedom about Yeah, it. and Beth and I kind of realized, like last year, a year before or something, we started realizing that of all these different groups, and like tribes or whatever you want to call them, the skaters, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, the skaters are the ones that seem to still be doing stuff, like they're doing right. clothes, they're doing the Burnside things where they're just building their own parks, or right. you know, they're making their own magazines, they're making their own photos, all that kind of type stuff. Right. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's kind of cool that they're, you know, I mean, they definitely want to know about their history and they're looking back, but they're right. not just continually looking back and missing all the stuff that's going on in front of them and they're still creating things. So, so it's cool. It's cool. I noticed there's a guitar here, Tim. I was wondering if we could convince you to... Where'd that come from? <laughs> just magically happen to have a guitar uh -huh. if you'd play us a song. Now you're playing, uh, you mentioned Bert Jantz, so you play uh, old time and Irish music? On I started playing Irish music like 10 years ago and uh, played button accordion, and, uh, which everybody calls the Alzheimer's buster. And uh, got pulled into old time through the people that were playing Irish. Uh, was playing guitar a little bit, but then started to learn banjo and did claw hammer and don't really play guitar that much anymore, so, mm. but. Uh, what kind of tune is this? Uh, making it up, here making we go. Making it up. <laughs> Tim Kerr. Um, Thanks, Tim. <laughs>